In this tutorial, I'm going to show you everything you need to know to get started with Schemalang, the language that's used to define components in Spatial OS. If you aren't familiar with Spatial OS and are interested in creating your own multiplayer online games with over 100 concurrent users, then I suggest checking out my Spatial OS overview video by clicking this link here or using the link in the description. Otherwise, let's get right into it. But first, this video is sponsored by Improbable, the creators of Spatial OS. If you're looking for a full stack multiplayer solution, then you'll definitely want to check out the Spatial OS platform. It provides networking, hosting, and multiplayer features that help you rapidly create your own multiplayer online game that's backed by a robust infrastructure. Sign up for free using the link in the description and get started today. All Spatial OS projects are built using a variation of the Entity Component System pattern. That means that, behind the scenes, every rock, building, and player in a Spatial OS game is an entity, and each one of those entities is defined by the set of its components. Components hold state data, like health, position, and really anything that can be used to simulate some sort of behavior. In other words, they're the fundamental building blocks that make up every Spatial OS project. But as a developer, how do you go about defining components for your game? What does the code actually look like? This is an example of a simple worker that's using the Spatial OS GDK for Unity. Components are responsible for storing all of an entity's data, but workers are the one that do, well, all of the work. This worker updates the health component of every entity within its view of the Spatial OS world where it's deployed. During each frame, it decrements the value of the health component's current health property using the update object. But where does all of this component code come from? Do you have to write it? And what if you want to implement this same logic for some other worker that doesn't support c -sharp? Are you supposed to rewrite all of the supporting code that's responsible for this logic? Luckily, the answer to both of those questions is no. While this particular example uses c -sharp, the actual component code was written in a completely different language called Schemalang. You see, you don't actually write components in all of their boilerplate code by hand. Instead, you define components within schema files that live inside of the schema directory. Then, you generate their API code in the language of your project using Spatial OS's code generator. Now, all schema files must adhere to a few basic rules. Let's break one down. The first line of every schema file is its package definition. It's one of a handful of elements that are required to be present in your schema. The package definition works just like a namespace. It allows you to place your schema files anywhere you want inside of the schema directory, and you can use it to reference user-defined types from other schema files within your project. More on that later. Components are defined using the component keyword. Each one contains a component ID and some combination of properties, events, and commands. The component ID is the only element that's actually required, and it must be unique at the project level. Properties have IDs as well, but they only have to be unique at the component level. As the developer, it's your job to assign IDs to your components. So it's important to know that IDs ranging from 0 to 100 and 190,000 to 199,999 are reserved for system use. So as long as you choose a number outside of those two ranges, and that's not being used by another component inside of your project, then you should be good to go. Once you've chosen a unique ID for your component, you'll want to start giving it properties, events, and commands. Properties define an entity's persistent state. Events allow an entity to broadcast to other workers that something has happened to it. And commands allow a worker to send remote procedure calls to an entity. Each one of these elements is assigned at least one type. Much like any other language, schema lang comes with a set of built-in types and supports the creation of user-defined types as well. This is a table containing all of the primitive types that Schemalang provides. Among the more commonly used ones are Boolean, Float, String, and Byte types. There's also a set of special types, Coordinates, Vector3D, and Vector3F, that are provided by Improbable. Coordinates represent positions in space, while the vector types represent vector-based values like velocity. Along with primitives, Schemalang also provides three types of built-in collections, options, lists, and maps. 
An option represents either a single value of type t or no value at all. A list represents zero or more values of some type t. And a map represents a set of key value pairs of some types k and v. Collections are pretty straightforward and operate just as you'd expect, except for one caveat. Collections cannot be nested within one another. For example, you can't create a list of options or a map with a list value. Instead, you'll need to create wrappers to nest your collections in. Next up, schema lang wouldn't be complete without enumerations. Enumerations are data types that contain a set of user-defined values. They're defined using the enum keyword. Again, they're pretty straightforward. The only thing you really need to know is that each user-defined value must be assigned an ID that's unique to the enum. Speaking of user-defined types, you can create and reuse your own custom types using the type keyword. Custom types look exactly like components. They have a name that you define and a set of properties that make up their state. One difference they have is that you can actually define custom types that are nested within other custom types, which opens up a whole new world of sophisticated data representations. Now, being able to define your own custom types is great, but you don't want to store them all in the same place, or else you'll end up with one big schema file. Instead, it's better to separate them and organize your schema logically using packages and a well-defined folder structure. Then you can simply import groups or individual types as needed. This is made possible by using the import keyword and referencing the schema file where your custom type is defined. Once you have that in place, you can reference your custom type by either just its name or through its fully qualified name that includes its package definition. The last thing that we're going to cover is naming conventions. Like most languages, schema lang code must adhere to certain syntax rules. For instance, the names of properties, events, and comments must use snakecase, and the names of components, user-defined types, and enumerations must use upper camel case. This is important because it allows SpatialOS to generate code for your schema in multiple languages without you having to do any extra work. Remember, Code generation is a key feature of SpatialOS and is the whole reason schema lang exists. That's pretty much everything you need to know to begin writing your own SpatialOS components using schema lang. If you haven't already, be sure to learn more about SpatialOS using the link in the description so you can start creating your own multiplayer online games today. And if you want to continue learning more about how to use SpatialOS, then be sure to subscribe to my channel. And Make sure to hit that bell icon so you'll be notified whenever I release a new Spatial OS tutorial. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video. To all of my patrons, and a special shout out to Dark Rush Photography, Yakov, Willen Dingo, Thomas, Sean Carey, Richard Stance, and NZ.